Hi. Today I want to talk to you about an argument from one of the most famous economists of the 20th century, John Kenneth Galbraith. It's called the dependence effect. Galbraith was an influential economist. He put his ideas about central planning and his suspicion of free enterprise into practice, partly as the head of economic planning under Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II, but then subsequently in influencing the John F. Kennedy administration and some subsequent administrations. He wrote a number of influential books, including one in 1958 called The Affluent Society. It was something that had a profound effect. It was a reflection of a cynicism about free enterprise, about capitalism, about in general the conduct of business and its moral status, as well as its economic status. He argued that central planning could do a better job and that in general a capitalist economy, one based on free enterprise, was one that was bound to overemphasize private goods at the expense of public goods. So he thought that an optimal allocation of resources could only be accomplished through central planning. Friedrich Hayek, another of the 20th century's greatest economists, a winner of the Nobel Prize, argued against Galbraith and was a great defender of free enterprise against central planning. In fact, his most famous book is probably The Road to Serfdom, published just after World War II, in which he argued that the central planning that was involved in conducting a war was completely inappropriate to civilian life and to the conduct of government generally. That free enterprise economies do a much better job of allocating resources, producing prosperity, and maintaining political freedom than any alternative. We're going to be looking at that debate, and I want to start by analyzing and laying out what I think is Galbraith's argument. Then we'll consider a variety of criticisms of it, most of them stemming from Hayek. But right now, I want to think about Galbraith's argument itself. Let's do it by beginning with the basic argument in favor of a free enterprise economy. It's a simple argument. It really says, people make free economic exchanges in order to improve their position. That is to say, two people make a trade of goods, services, money, whatever is of value, because each thinks that the trade will make that person better off. So, for example, let's say I am hungry, I'm willing to spend two dollars to get a taco. I'm doing that because I think I'll be better off with the taco than with the two dollars. The person selling the taco to me thinks they'll be better off with the two dollars than with the taco. And so we each improve our situation by making the trade. I'm happier because now I have the taco. That person's happier because he now has the two dollars. And so we both improve. In other words, the situation is that free economic exchanges improve the welfare of both parties. And so we can expect a free enterprise economy to, in general, lift people's welfare. We each enter into these exchanges thinking it's going to improve our welfare, and in general it does. Now, of course, there can be exceptions. And so everyone agrees that there are some times when I make these economic exchanges and it doesn't turn out to be something that actually benefits me. What about the cases where I do actually enter into the exchange thinking it's going to make me better off and it turns out not to make me better off? Sometimes I'm simply making a mistake. So I buy that car thinking it's going to serve my needs well, turns out to be a lemon, and it doesn't meet my needs well at all. Or I think this product is going to do what I need it to do, turns out it doesn't really do it, it does something else. Maybe it does it well, but in any case it doesn't solve the problem that I had. Maybe I buy that taco and then I find out, oh, it's not even very good. Or maybe I simply am confused about what it is I really want. And so I think I want that, and then I taste it, and it's like, no, that's not really what I wanted. Maybe there are some kind of products that routinely do this. Cotton candy, maybe. Looks very attractive. The first taste is delightful. By the time you eat much of it, you think, no, oh, this isn't very satisfying. Why did I do this? And maybe there are some other things like that as well. So, in short, yeah, sometimes you just make a mistake. You think something's going to satisfy you in the short term, and it really does not. Of course, other times you have damaging desires. You think that something is going to satisfy you in the short term, and it does, but it has serious long-term consequences. So maybe using drugs, for example, or using alcohol, or eating an unhealthy diet, or like this. You think you want those things, and in the short term, they make you happy, but in the long run, they're destructive. 
And that kind of thing can happen too. Our desires can diverge from our interests, especially our long-term interests, and we can choose things that in the end are not good for us. We've talked a lot about problems of weakness of will and the fact that you can give in to temptation in these cases, but of course it's not always just a question of temptation. You can do things without being aware that this short-term pleasure is actually going to have some serious long-term consequences. It is striking to see how many characters in movies, for example, smoke when you look at a movie made before 1964. Before the Surgeon General produced that warning, most people did not think of smoking as something that had any long-term health consequences. And so they thought it gave them short-term pleasure, helped them stay thin, didn't lead to any long-term effects, and so it wasn't a question of giving it a temptation there. They simply didn't know about the long-term consequences. Well, all of those things are possible, but Galbraith isn't talking about any of those. He distinguishes what he calls urgent desires from non-urgent desires, from especially contrived desires. Now, that's an odd way of putting it. In fact, urgency seems to me neither here nor there. I refer to a desire as urgent when I want it to be satisfied right now. I'm thirsty, and it's urgent, and I really need something to drink. But other times, we have a desire that may be very important to us. I would really like to, let's say, graduate, but it's not urgent. It's not like, yeah, look, I, I need to graduate this semester. and I, This is like, yeah, I'm a freshman. I eventually, of course, want to graduate. It's very important to me. But on the other hand, it's not an urgent desire. It's not like it's going to happen anytime soon. And so urgency is a question of time frame. That seems irrelevant to the question of how important a desire is. We have important desires that are not urgent. We have urgent desires that are not particularly important. So I think that's a mistake. We shouldn't talk in terms of urgency. He's really thinking of something like genuineness or maybe authenticity. The point is that some of our desires are really genuine. They're authentic desires. Other desires are inauthentic. They're not genuine. They're in some sense artificial. And the basic idea behind Galbraith's argument and behind what he calls the dependence effect is that some of our desires, in fact, typically the desires that people produce goods to meet in a free enterprise economy, are desires that are inauthentic. They are not genuine desires. They are contrived. We are manipulated into desiring various things, primarily through advertising. So here's the idea. If I have a genuine desire for something and I make an economic exchange thinking that I'm going to be better off as a result of satisfying that desire, well, as we've said, I might be making a mistake. There might be long-term consequences, but ordinarily, yes, that's going to make me better off if the desire is genuine. But what if it's not really an authentic desire? What if I've been manipulated into it? What if somebody's been pressuring me saying, you want this, don't you? Don't you want that? Don't you want that? And I finally said, yeah, okay, I guess I want that. that. Then you might say, I can't expect to be better off as a result of that. It might be that I'm not going to be better off at all. In fact, you might say the general assumption that normally I will be better off no longer applies if the desire is not a genuine desire, if it's not an authentic desire. It's in some way the result of contrivance or manipulation or something of that kind. And it's a plausible thought. The dependence effect is this. Some of our wants, some of our desires, depend on production. They aren't desires that people then produce products to meet. They are desires generated by the products themselves and by the people who are selling those products. So the image is roughly that consumers are being manipulated by companies. They're being manipulated by business into forming desires for their products. Those desires aren't genuine. They aren't authentic. We can't expect that satisfying them is going to actually make people happy. They're not going to be satisfied. It's not going to improve their welfare because they're being manipulated into having those desires in the first place. Well, there is some plausibility to the thought. 
If we look at the details of Galbraith's argument, I think it becomes harder to see exactly what's going on, but I think that's the core idea. Sometimes, at least, and he thinks typically, people are being manipulated to desire what they desire. And so in cases like that, there's no reason to think that their satisfaction of that desire is in fact going to prove satisfying to them, even in the short term. It's going to turn out to be unsatisfying, and if anything, encourage a craving for more inauthentic desires to be satisfied. And so he thinks in general, satisfying desires like that is not going to improve people's welfare, or at least it's not going to improve people's welfare as much as fulfilling genuine desires does. And then he thinks that the provision of public goods in general satisfies genuine desires to a greater degree than private goods do.